Manitoba and Winnipeg has lost its greatest champion. Well, there's lots of wealthy people, but they don't do what Dick Yask and his family have done. Try to find in Canadian history a city that has had such a generous benefactor. I don't think it exists. I think this has been extraordinary, and uh, we're, we've been very blessed by his life. Good evening, and thanks for joining us. Israel asked for cast a very long shadow. You may not have always agreed with his politics, but there's no question Asper gave a lot to Winnipeg. Tonight, we look back at his life and his legacy. And beginning our team coverage tonight is CKY's Kelly Den. Kelly joins us now from the Asper Jewish Community Campus. Kelly, what kind of an imprint did Asper leave on the city? Well, Janet, uh, take a look at this, uh, this campus, for example, the Asper Jewish Community Center. He was a driving force behind this learning and cultural and uh, recreational facility. His name is on buildings all over the city, but his contributions are much more far-reaching than that. He built a global media empire and made no apologies for basing it in Winnipeg. According to those who knew Izzy Asper, he was a man of many passions. He loved jazz. He had boundless enthusiasm for his family, his business, and his city, and mixed them all together. We will add whole new divisions to the operation uh, in Winnipeg, because that's, that's home. Born in Minnedosa, Manitoba in 1932, Israel Harold Asper would go on to build a media empire and become a billionaire. But those who knew him describe him as a generous man who gave back to his community, helping build Canwest Global Park, making major contributions to the Asper School of Business, the Asper Foundation, the Winnipeg Foundation, you know, you come and the St. Boniface Hospital Research Foundation. I, I've been here lots of times, so frequently by ambulance, actually. <laughs> and it was to St. Boniface Hospital where Asper was rushed around 9.30 in the morning. He died a short while later in the presence of his family. I couldn't believe it. I, I, was, I, I just had to think about it for a moment. You know, I just saw him a few days ago, and he looked so good. And, you know, it just shows you that you have to embrace every day of life and enjoy it to the fullest. And um, we'll never replace a man like Izzy Asper. Lieutenant Governor Peter sure. Lieber was a founding shareholder of what is now Canwest Communications and the president of CKND, the first television station in the Asper Empire. He says one of the driving forces in Asper's life in the past few years was the creation of the Canadian Museum for Human Rights. That's one of the goals he... Um, had not yet achieved at the time of his death, but I know that uh, things are in place and that they will continue and that others will ensure that, in fact, uh, this wonderful edifice, in fact, is built here. But for as public a life as Izzy Asper lived, he did many things quietly, things Mary Glenn Murray says Winnipeggers never heard about. I can't tell you how many times I've quietly discovered that something happened in the city because someone was short five or ten thousand dollars for a project and discreetly and quietly uh, a, a donation would arrive from one of the Asper's many foundations or contributions or personally from Izzy that just allowed dozens of things to happen. Izzy Asper, the chain-smoking, tough-as-nails dealmaker, dead at 71. A man who'll be known not just for the money he made, but the money he shared. You can't take it with you, and since you're going to leave it behind, you may as well do something meaningful with it. Now, the uh, flags at the Asper campus are flying at half-staff tonight. They're the Israeli and the Canadian flags in honor, of course, of Izzy Asper. Now, Israel Asper was, of course, known as Izzy, but it's apparently a nickname he's not quite sure how he ever got stuck with, and apparently one that he didn't like very much. Gordon Jenner? All right, Kelly, what about the uh, companies, of course, he ran here? Any word on whether they could move from Winnipeg? Well, according to the people I spoke with today, they say that's not very likely. The company has just spent a lot of money and a lot of effort in consolidating their head office operations here in Winnipeg. And as well, the children remaining running the company, of course, Leonard and uh, David and Gail, have uh, a lot of dedication to this community as well, like their father did. And I've been told that it's not likely that the head office will be moving out of Winnipeg. Gordon Janet? Thanks very much, Kelly. That's CKY's Kelly Dan reporting live tonight. Asper helped build Manitoba's economy. He also fought for the province on the political stage. CKY's Karen Mitchell continues tonight's top story team coverage. Love him or hate him, Israel Harold Asper was a force to be reckoned with, a media mogul. The firing of the Ottawa Citizens editor led to criticisms that CanWest Communications was interfering in the editorial decisions of its newspapers, reportedly for criticizing the Prime Minister. Russell Mills was fired because the Prime Minister's buddy happened to be his boss. 
It was the kind of controversy that Izzy Asper never shied away from. But those who knew him say he made his decisions in good faith. I think that it's fair to say that uh, Izzy Asper built his company based on some very strongly held views. He never backed away from defending those views, and um, he carried through uh, a passion into his workplace and into the direction that he provided to his company that was absolutely un unequivocal. Before entering the media limelight, Asper spent years on the political stage. From 1970 to 75, he led the Manitoba Liberal Party. He represented Wolseley as member of the Liberal opposition for three years. And over the years, he did become friends with Prime Minister Jean Chrétien. The two just visited Friday night in Winnipeg at a Liberal fundraiser. I was shocked to learn this morning that he, he passed away because he looked quite in good shape when I saw him on Friday. Even after Asper turned from politics to the media, he kept busy politically, fighting for Western Canada. He thought Meech Lake was a bad deal for the West and said so. The only way we're going to do that is by changing the economic rules of the game in this country and maintaining uh, equality of the, the ten provinces. Asper continued to fight for the West to the end. Even though their political stripes differed, Premier Gary Dewar and Asper worked together on deals they thought were best for Manitoba. He was negotiating hard to make sure that we had the floodway uh, in place uh, with his contacts in the federal government. Perhaps the Prime Minister summed Asper up best, saying, above all, Izzy always remained a regular guy. Karen Mitchell, CKY News. A service for Israel Asper is scheduled for this Thursday at the Sherry Zedek Synagogue. That's on Wellington Crescent, just south of the Maryland Bridge in River Heights. The service will begin at 1 o'clock. CK1 News headlines tonight. Israel Asper has died. The founder of Can West Global Communications was 71 years old. Police hope tonight, stay with us for a look back at his life in images. Asper, stay with us. We leave you with some images from a man who loved Winnipeg, Israel Asper. Good night. Good evening. Preparations are underway to remember Izzy Asper. His funeral is tomorrow and dignitaries from across the country are coming to Winnipeg, including the Prime Minister. As Mike Edgel reports, Asper was an entrepreneur to the very end. This Winnipeg synagogue is quiet now, but will soon host one of its largest events ever, the funeral of Izzy Asper, an entrepreneur who friends say was an outspoken champion for Israel regardless of the implications for his business ventures. He was very courageous. He carried a message that none other Jewish leader in the world did it. And for us, it's a tremendous loss to lose the voice 
the personality and the vision of his diaspora. He helped build two community centers for poor kids in Israel, but was also a champion, supporters say, for Winnipeg by keeping his business here. Showed the way by building a successful company, and, and it's not just about business. How he showed the importance of not only uh, building business here, but generously giving back to the community. Son, Leonard Asper, has been running day-to-day -day operations at CanWest Global in recent years. But as he hinted in January, his father continued to play a major role. That means I'll continue to get the last word in, which is, yes, Dad, yes, Dad, whatever you say, Dad. Some analysts say the ship will stay the course. Izzy certainly made sure that there were plans for everything to continue in his absence. Others see potential change. Uh, the editorial policy that exists within the newspaper division, uh, maintaining control in Winnipeg, does that change? Um, where does the National Post go as, a, as an entity? And what about the TV investments overseas? It's hard to say if the Asper children have the same international aspirations. Ken West has a presence in Ireland, New Zealand, and Australia. There was no genius. There was no magic. That's all we did is applied the same value system, same corporate culture that we had applied in Canada, and it worked. Sounds like it's not there yet. Ken West officials won't discuss the future of the company just yet. They, like many Manitobans, are taking time to mourn. Mike Edgell, CBC News, Winnipeg. You're running this for three weeks? And Even after he grudgingly agreed to play a tune, Izzy Asper seemed distracted. Here was a man who had just put his fourth career behind him and gave no hint of slowing down. I have a lot of things I want to do before I depart, and uh, I don't want to waste any more time looking at financial statements. Financial statements were just part of what became a true Canadian success story. The tale of a tax lawyer turned politician turned businessman who scripted his own larger-than-life image as a media tycoon. It was an extraordinary 71 years. I know him since a long time because uh, he was uh, the leader of the Liberal Party and when he was a younger man in Manitoba, so I know him since a long time. And was a great, uh, you know, a great Canadian. He, was, he had a strong conviction on everything, and uh, it was always pleasant to talk with him. Is that a decision? Izzy Asper was unique, bold, opinionated, a tough businessman who seemed to relish causing a stir, as this interview with the CBC in the late 80s suggests. I'm not a shrinking violet. I don't uh, retreat from a challenge or a fight. And there were a few fights along the way towards creating Canada's largest media empire, one that started when Asper founded CKND, a tiny television station he picked up in North Dakota and shipped to an old Safeway store in southeast Winnipeg. He kept it afloat with an early stake in Toronto-based Global Television, a floundering network that Asper would turn into a full-fledged third national TV network. Izzy Asper died this morning, suffering a heart attack at home in Winnipeg, passing away a short time later with his wife and three children by his side. His personality and business acumen were a potent mix. Lots of uh, titans of commerce are very sort of gray and anonymous individuals. Uh, Izzy Asper made no secret of uh, his convictions and Mr. I.H. Asper himself. Convictions that would take him further and further. The making of Global would lay the groundwork for Asper's bold foray into print with a $3.2 billion purchase of the Southern Newspaper Group and other assets from Conrad Black's Hollinger Inc. The company now owns 11 major metro dailies, including the National Post. It was an empire with down-home roots. Here was a Canadian uh, from one of the power bases outside of uh, the traditional power bases of media, if you will, who was prepared not only to build a company, but build it from a uh, Winnipeg location. Asper openly called his media empire a business like any other, once telling employees they sell a product like soap. But friends say he cared about quality. We reached Conrad Black at his home in London, England. He was always very concerned with content, I thought, and as far as I knew him in the newspaper business, and, and he certainly knew as a television executive that uh, if you didn't put proper competitive programming on the air, you, you, know, you obviously wouldn't get the ratings and wouldn't sell the ads. But Ken West, the media empire, was not without controversy, particularly a policy that called for some Ken West editorials to be written by head office. It led to public resignations and firings, including Russell Mills from the Ottawa Citizen. He was a 
larger-than-life figure, uh, a very dominant person, a person who had very strong views on, on a lot of issues and wanted to use his newspapers to push those views. Asper would become defined as much by his empire as his outspokenness. He was a staunch defender of Israel and openly took issue with any coverage he accused of being biased against it, including the CBC's. It was one of his criticisms against a government-supported broadcaster. I don't believe in state-subsidized corporations, you, CBC, competing against the private tax-paying uh, sector of the economy. But for all his bottom-line approach, Asper believed in giving back to his community. He remained fiercely loyal to Manitoba and Winnipeg, and thanks to millions in donations, the family name appears on buildings across the city. His contributions are, are, are endless. Uh, everything from the ball diamond to the bombers to uh, the building behind us here. That Manitoba's premier says the entire us. country is mourning the loss. Certainly we have a tremendous... Uh, a uh, tremendous person with the life of Izzy Asper in Manitoba and Canada and in the world. And as I say, he will really be missed. A funeral will be held this Thursday. It will mark the end of what no one can argue was a remarkable life. Joanna Brumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. Winnipeg philanthropist and Ken West global founder, lawyer, politician, media mogul, and fiercely proud Winnipegger, I.H. Asper passes away at the age of 71. Good evening, thanks for joining us. A Canadian media giant and a giant here in Winnipeg has passed away. The founder of CanWest Global Communications and Winnipeg philanthropist Israel Asper died this morning at St. Boniface Hospital. He was 71. There's no official word yet on the cause of death, but Mr. Asper had suffered heart problems in recent years. He was, admit he was admitted to St. Boniface Hospital at 9.30 this morning, where he passed away a short time later, surrounded by his family, wife Babs, his sons David and Leonard, and daughter Gail. The media mogul and business leader launched Canada's largest private sector media empire from Winnipeg. The global television network is just one under the CanWest Global Communications banner that includes specialty channels, the National Post, daily newspapers in practically every major Canadian city, weekly newspapers, radio stations here and in New Zealand, plus another television network in Australia and Ireland, completing his vision of a truly global company. In a statement from corporate headquarters on Portage in Maine, company spokesman expressed a sense of profound loss on the passing of our founder, who distinguished himself as a visionary business leader, a caring leader in his encouragement and financial support of worthy causes, and as a champion of Israel. It's the end of an era, in effect, and, uh, and of course we're all uh, profoundly saddened by it. Mr. Asper was a, uh, was a person who was uh, very, he was a brilliant person, but he was also approachable. It was a joy to work uh, in proximity to him, and, uh, and uh, he was always uh, a pleasure to work with. The Kent West Global founder launched his media empire from humble beginnings here in Manitoba. Born in Minnedosa to Russian immigrant parents, he founded this station, CKND, at the corner of St. Anne's and St. Mary's, and from there rose to the heights of Canadian business. Global's Connie Tomoto has that story. He was one of Canada's most successful businessmen, but Israel H. Asper's beginnings were humble. Born in 1932 in the western Manitoba town of Minnedosa to Russian immigrants Leon and Cecilia Asper, Izzy had a lot of time to familiarize himself with the entertainment business at the family-owned theater. But in 1945, the Asper family moved to Winnipeg. It was there that Izzy made his first impression as an up-and-coming leader. Tenacious is the best way to describe him. Here's a guy who, who went from absolutely nowhere to being a powerhouse in the Canadian en entertainment and the media industry. A graduate of Calvin High School, Izzy's yearbook caption read, has a complex. Who needs Einstein or Lincoln when Izzy's around? He'll do the thinking. From there, Asper attended the University of Manitoba, where he obtained his law degree. 
During that time, he worked as a music writer for the university's paper, marking his first foray into the media business. As he was, was one of a kind as a businessman. He, he really marched to his own drum. He had his own vision of his company, he had his own vision um, for what he wanted to build. That vision began with the purchase of CKND-TV with then-business partner Peter Leba in 1975. He then went on to acquire Global TV in the 80s, along with stations in both Australia and New Zealand. In 2000, he solidified his title as Canada's media baron with a $3.2 billion acquisition of Hollinger Incorporated, including the National Post and 149 other newspapers. He was an absolutely dedicated Manitoban who, in his earlier life, uh, and then throughout his career, uh, was always under pressure to, to uh, relocate uh, in Toronto, the business uh, capital, uh, and, uh, and passionately uh, uh, not only opposed that, but uh, continued to, continue to make his home here uh, because this is where his home was. Izzy Asper's vision, CanWest Global Communications, located here in the heart of downtown Winnipeg, has now grown into a multi-billion dollar media empire. Throughout it all, the 71-year-old never forgot his roots, opening his own version of the Lyric Theatre at Assiniboine Park in 1999. The funeral service will take place at 1 o'clock on Thursday at the Sherazetic Synagogue. The city is also organizing a special ceremony to mark Asper's death. Those details, those details, pardon me, will be released at a later date after discussions with his family. Media mogul, businessman, lawyer, and politician. Not only did Israel Asper lead the provincial Liberal Party in the mid-70s, his political influence reached across Canada. And today, Canada's political leaders mourn the loss. Uh, Izzy Asper uh, stood for what was best in our community, best in our province. He stood up for the interests of this community and spoke of its uh, excellence and its uh, opportunity for all our citizens. We lost uh, one of our greatest citizens, um, a man who uh, in his uh, lifetime achieved so much and yet had so much uh, left to achieve. He, he is one of the city's great men. He's one of Canada's great men and one of our great philanthropists and one of our great and true believers. I, uh, I can't think, I don't think there's a way to ever replace someone like that. And I think for many of us, it's, it's a moment of great sadness. It was a great, uh, you know, a great Canadian. He, was, he had a strong conviction on everything and uh, it was always pleasant to talk with him. And he was, uh, I know him since a long time and I was shocked to learn this morning that he, he passed away because he looks quite in good shape when I saw him on Friday. His tremendous love for Winnipeg and his desire to use what he had been able to build up to help build up Winnipeg. And that, that ability never to have forgotten his roots, I think is a tremendous, tremendous tribute to an outstanding Canadian, Izzy Asper. Perhaps even more than his political influence and dizzying business feats, Izzy Asper was known as a philanthropist and a huge booster of Winnipeg. He gave millions, tens of millions of dollars to his favorite charities, organizations, and causes. Global's Lisa Ritzak has more. You can't take it with you, and since you're going to leave it behind, you may as well do something meaningful with it. And with that, Israel Asper is perhaps one of the most giving philanthropists Manitoba has ever seen. Izzy Asper has left his mark on Winnipeg, there's no question about it. And I think we're all saddened by this loss. Cates and Asper started their team effort in 1999. Can West Global Park, a ball diamond visited by thousands every year. Just walk around the city and everywhere you'll see something that Izzy Asper and his family made a reality. Asper shared at least $2 million with the University of Manitoba to found the Asper School of Business. In 1997, he started the Asper Jewish Community Campus. But perhaps some of his largest gifts were to the Winnipeg Foundation and the Jewish Foundation of Winnipeg. Those were donations worth $20 million. I think people should do this during their lifetime, and I hope this sets some sort of an example to others in the community. Asper contributed $5 million to the I.H. Asper Clinical Research Institute at St. Boniface Hospital. In 1999, he built the Lyric Theatre in Assiniboine Park, worth $500,000 and his last endeavor is the Human Rights Museum at the Forks. Art Mickey helped in the planning. I sort of sensed that there were some, you know, maybe uh, ailments that uh, he was going through, and 
so in that sense, uh, I think the museum became sort of a very important thing to ensure that at least uh, he, he saw the fruits of it being developed. And Winnipeggers are quick to recognize the contributions Asper made. He gave a lot back to the city and to the province, probably, things that we don't even know about. He gave back, and I think that's probably the legacy. It's, it's what he's left, but it's the example that he set. The impact Asper has had on Manitoba is so great, many are already saying he's a man who can never be replaced. Lisa Hertzak, Global News, Winnipeg. Many are feeling a sense of loss with the passing of Israel Asper. While he made his reputation as a businessman and media mogul, he was also the man who the Premier turned to in 1995 to save the Jets. Israel Asper would be the first to admit that he wasn't much of a sports fan. In fact, he turned down a chance to buy a portion of the Winnipeg Jets in the mid-1980s, as he couldn't find a reason why he'd want to be a co-owner of an NHL team. Mr. Asper is In 1995, when it was announced that the Jets were leaving town, it was then Premier Gary Philman who turned to Asper in a last-ditch effort to keep the Jets in Winnipeg. Asper would lead the MEC, a group of local businessmen that would do their best to purchase the Jets and ensure the construction of a new arena. All people in this city make it clear that this is an outside chance of it all coming together. During the initial negotiations to purchase the Jets from Barry Shankro and his partners, there was expressed dissatisfaction from the current owners over the MEC's offer. In typical Asper fashion, he was quick to react. I don't give a damn about how disappointed you. This offer represents an embellishment and improvement on what they agreed to. If they've changed their mind, that's their prerogative. In the end, Asper and his group would give way to the spirit of Manitoba. And that group would be unsuccessful in their efforts to save the Jets. Our top story now. Ken West Global founder and Winnipeg philanthropist I.H. Asper passed away this morning at the age of 71. But we leave you tonight with your thoughts on the life and death of a great Winnipegger. Good night. He set an example that with wealth, you have the opportunity to, to really make something of a, of a place. Whatever aspect of Winnipeg that he appreciated, was fond of, he kept giving back. He was a great human being, very different ideas. And, uh, yeah, he was, he was an icon, I would say. He's always been a part of Winnipeg and the U of M especially. And that's just a shame. He wasted no time giving as much back to the community as he possibly could. Remembering a media legend, also a Manitoba icon. Israel Asper died of a heart attack this morning at St. Boniface Hospital. A channel's Joe Olipson has reaction to his death and looks back on the accomplishments of the much beloved businessman. What an extraordinary man and what a great loss for us. It's a loss being felt throughout the province as Manitobans mourn the loss of Israel Asper, affectionately known in these parts as Izzy. I feel I lost somebody in my own family. <laughs> well, he really liked this city, I think. I think in lots of ways he's put Winnipeg on the map. Uh, Izzy Asper uh, stood for what was best in our community, uh, best in our province. You don't have to look very far to see that love of his community, whether it be the media empire that has maintained its Manitoba roots, to the opening of the School of Business which bears his name, to the Jewish community campus, Asper is known for his generosity. Try to find in Canadian history a city that has had such a generous benefactor. I don't think it exists. I think this has been extraordinary and uh, where we've been very blessed by his life. Asper passed away suddenly Tuesday morning with his family by his side here at St. Boniface Hospital. Ironically, just steps away from the research foundation he so passionately supported. It's just one of the ways many people say Asper has left his mark on our city. I don't think I use the word great very often when describing a man, but Izzy Asper was a great man, and you don't replace people like that. Sam Cates knows firsthand. Asper came to him with the idea of building a ballpark in downtown Winnipeg. 
We know it now as Canwest Global Park, the home of the Gold Eyes. If I could be one-tenth of Izzy Asper, and I don't mean wealth-wise, I mean just what he did for this community, I'd be a very contented man when my number is called. And perhaps his greatest legacy is yet to come. His latest vision, a human rights museum at the Forks, is currently under construction. Israel Asper was 71 years old. Joe Olofsson, A-Channel News Now. Funeral services for Izzy Asper are planned for this Thursday. It starts at 1 o'clock at the Sheree Zedek Synagogue on Wellington Crescent. The funeral for Israel Asper is scheduled for this Thursday at the Sheree Zedek Synagogue. That's on Wellington Crescent, just south of the Maryland Bridge in River Heights. The service begins at 1 o'clock. <clears throat> Excuse me. Asper died yesterday morning of a heart attack. He was 71. The big shoes that fell. A new era begins at Canada's largest media conglomerate as preparations are underway to lay its founder to rest. Good evening. Preparations are well underway for tomorrow's funeral service for Ken West Global founder Israel Asper. The service for the Winnipeg media mogul and philanthropist will take place here at the Sherazetic Synagogue at the corner of Wellington Crescent and Academy Road on the south side of Maryland Bridge at 1 o'clock. The synagogue holds about 1,500 people. A number of those seats will be reserved for the many dignitaries expected to attend. Speakers might be set up outside to allow the anticipated overflow crowd to hear the service. The list of confirmed dignitaries include Prime Minister Jean Chrétien and the Queen's representative in Manitoba. Lieutenant Governor Peter Leba, who was also Izzy Asper's longtime friend and one-time business partner, Premier Gary Dewar and members of Cabinet will also be in attendance, as well, Mayor Glenn Murray and members of City Council. Israel's Consul General to Canada is flying in from Ottawa to attend the service. So are representatives from Conrad Black's Hollinger Incorporated from Toronto. Paul Martin's camp says the, leader, the Liberal leadership frontrunner will also attend tomorrow's service, and so will Canadian Alliance leader Stephen Harper. The who's who in Canadian political and business circles is a reflection of Izzy, Ap Izzy Asper's circle of influence. The reins of his flagship companies, Ken West Global, now lies firmly in the hands of his son, Leonard. As Global's Connie Tomoto reports, Leonard Asper released a statement today promising to continue the vision set forth by his father. <laughs> He stood by his father's side for the launch of Cool TV and the acquisition of the National Post. But with the sudden passing of Israel Asper, 39-year-old Leonard Asper now stands alone as the president and CEO of Canwest Global Communications. The big shoes that fell. You know, size 13 triple E's. I just try not to compare myself to him. I could never have done what he did. On the other hand, I know I don't have to. I've got to do a different job, so I don't have to worry about living up to that. I just focus on what i got to do for the next 20 years. He's been in training for this job for a lot of years, so uh, it doesn't come as any surprise to him. He's been, he's went, came straight from university right into the company. Leonard Asper joined his father's company in 1991 and became CEO in 1999, following a carefully scripted succession plan. The company put in place a succession plan for, for top management a number of years ago. Uh, Leonard Asper assumed the position of president and chief executive officer, in fact, in 1999. And while Leonard prepares to take his father's vision forward, it's likely he'll have to face the same pressure his father faced to move the company out of Winnipeg. What people have said to me in London, in Los Angeles, in New York over the last number of years, uh, 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 making reference to the fact that, what are you doing in Winnipeg? Israel Asper created a media empire here, employing over 10,000. He brought people from Toronto to Winnipeg, bringing back the head office, working with Canwest Global and some of the incredible projects in the downtown. A commitment to the city admired by the business community. It's starting with an idea of creating a national network and aggressively pursuing it all out of Winnipeg against all the obstacles that he faced uh, to create not only the national network but a global empire. He's showing the people of Manitoba that you can run a world-class organization from Winnipeg. He clearly believes in this community and, and he has done it. In this statement released to Can West employees this morning, Leonard says, 
The death of my father, our founder, our chairman yesterday morning was a shock to us all. Israel Asper meant so much to so many, it is difficult to imagine a world without him. His legacy remains with us all. We will continue to be guided by his vision and the course he set. Wherever one is, if one wants to be in a global business, one will be on an airplane. And uh, so, you know, Winnipeg versus Toronto versus New York, doesn't matter. Connie Tomoto, Global News, Winnipeg. Once again, the funeral service for Israel Asper takes place tomorrow at the Sherazadeh Synagogue on Wellington and Academy. The service is open to the public. I'm Krista Erickson in Winnipeg. Tonight, Izzy Asper dies. Uh, Manitoba and Winnipeg has lost its greatest champion. I think it'll be a long, long time before someone of his uh, ilk comes past our, past our province again. A look back at the life of one of Winnipeg's most influential businessmen. Good evening. He was a man of enormous power and influence, rising from humble beginnings right here in Manitoba. And today, at the age of 71, Israel Asper has died. He was taken to the St. Boniface Hospital at about 9.30 this morning and passed away shortly after that. At his side, his wife, two sons, and his only daughter. The cause of his death has not been confirmed. Tonight we have extensive coverage and we begin with the CBC's Richard Madden who joins us live from our newsroom. Richard. Krista, it seems just about everywhere you go in Winnipeg, the Asper name is everywhere. And that could be further testament to a man many people say was a philanthropist, a savvy businessman, or even just a person who provided hundreds of jobs for people in Winnipeg and indeed across the country. And what makes this story even more remarkable is his old empire, Ken West Global Communications, was started here in Winnipeg in an old grocery store on St. Mary's Avenue. And right across the country today, people were honoring him. Here's just a sample of what many people had to say. Well, I know him since a long time because uh, he was uh, the leader of the Liberal Party when he was a younger man in Manitoba. So I know him since a long time and was a great, uh, you know, a great Canadian. Uh, he is a Manitoban who, having achieved phenomenal financial success in business, has made phenom phenomenal financial contributions back into, the, into this community. The torch uh, that he is passing on to the whole community must be held high. The excellence that he exhibited to all of us in terms of reaching for the top. Uh, he's an entrepreneur that uh, took the city of Winnipeg into places like Australia, Ireland, uh, it's, a, it's a sad day, and uh, he's touched so many people. Izzy is a Canadian icon. He's a Winnipeg icon. There is, there is no other Izzy Asper. He is a, a man to, to whom Winnipegers owe a huge debt. It's a sad, it's a sad day for the city of Winnipeg, because Izzy Asper is known and liked by all. His contributions are, are, are endless. Uh, everything from the ball diamond to the bombers to uh, the building behind us here, uh, and, and the universities, and just... It's going to be a sad loss for us. One of the most brilliant business people that in this country, uh, generous, and I'm sorry he's gone. I look up to him. Well, there you have it, uh, Krista. A lot of reaction from people across the country. Uh, Israel Asper, of course, is survived by his wife, Babs, and his three children, Leonard, David, and Gail. Uh, as for Can West Global Communications, now they issued a statement this morning, and I'll just read you a, a paragraph of it. It says the country, the company feels a sense of profound loss on the passing of our founder. Uh, the company described him as a visionary business leader, a caring leader, and a champion of Israel. As for the Asper funeral, uh, a company spokesman for Can West Global said the funeral will be held on Thursday at one o'clock at the Sherry Zedek Synagogue, and that's on Wellington Crescent. So a big loss for the city tonight. Indeed, thank you, Richard. The CBC's Richard Madden reporting live from our newsroom. For everything the business world gave Asper, he tried to give back to the community, distinguishing himself as a man of great generosity. The CBC's Leah Hendry has more. Ribbon cuttings and check presentations. Izzy Asper had been to his share. One of the most high-profile philanthropists in Winnipeg, Asper's influence can be seen around the city, but no more so than at St. Boniface General Hospital, where his enthusiasm will be sorely missed. His most recent project there, the Asper Institute. And his dream was for us to become the best in the world as well. So uh, this was uh, Izzy Asper, and uh, his gifts were always accompanied with that uh, vision of his to make our community better. 
uh, to make our uh, community uh, basically a worldwide uh, and, and a cutting edge uh, kind of place where anybody would want to come and live. Another institution that benefited? The University of Manitoba. He was always involved with the university in some way, shape or form because he really believed in this place. But Asper's dream to put Winnipeg on the map won't end with his death, says close friend Alan Usum. I believe it's more than a name on a community campus, more than a name on a, a, a sports stadium, or more than a, a name on another building. Uh, the gifts that uh, this man has, uh, uh, has generated uh, uh, to this community uh, will continue uh, uh, to grow, uh, they will continue to bloom, and uh, they will bloom in our garden. And for those who wonder who will fill the philanthropic void, Look no further than his own family, says Yusum. Uh, we have his children. Uh, they're more than capable. As for the company he built from the ground up, a spokesman says business will continue as usual. He, he was not a daily presence in the office, but, uh, but clearly he, um, uh, uh, he maintained a very strong interest in the broad strategic direction of the company. In the last few years, Asper handed over the reins of power to his son, Leonard, so he could pursue his charity work work he never regretted. And I think one should do this during his lifetime rather than when he's old and uh, or, or uh, passed away. Leah Hendry, CBC News, Winnipeg. Asper spoke with CBC News at length earlier this year in a feature interview and it was a candid conversation, one with a particular theme, his regrets in life. Here now is part of that interview. For all of his accomplishments in business, this is what Izzy Asper really loved to do. Reflecting on his profession in this interview a few months ago, Asper says his career could have taken an entirely different path. I made a mistake. I, I, I wanted to... I thought at one point I was good enough to make a career in music. And then I decided I wasn't. And I will never know if I was right or not. And I, it's not the only regret he has. Asper revealed some of them and talked about what inspired his decision in January to step down from the company he spent 25 years building. I have my own agenda. I have a lot of things I want to do before I depart, and uh, I don't want to waste any more time looking at financial statements. But before financial statements, this was Asper's life, the Manitoba legislature where he served as leader of the provincial Liberal Party. Under his leadership, the party held only five seats. We have candidates coming forward in most of our ridings now, and they're good candidates, and we don't want to see them discouraged, so we're going ahead with our election plans. Regrets that I left it? Uh, none. Uh, regret that I didn't uh, succeed at it? Plenty. Uh, would I like to have been, say, Premier of Manitoba? Absolutely. I had a vision, a concept. Uh, a plan for how I would uh, develop Manitoba into a center of prosperity, industrial activity, commercial uh, uh, opportunity. And so came the opportunities in business. In 1974, Asper created CKND, a television station in Winnipeg. Three years later, he formed CanWest Global Communications, a company he built up into an international television network with stations across Canada and around the world. When an opportunity came up to go into the communications business, I said, well, that's, that's, that, that may be a good substitute for what I was trying to do in, in politics. And uh, in some ways it was, but still it was business as opposed to the creative side, which is where I really wanted to be. I wanted to be where you are. And uh, they kept saying, no, no, you, you're better talking to the bank about finding the money to pay the payroll. Leonard will read uh, the company's statement. The payroll went up in November of 2000 when Asper purchased a chain of Canadian newspapers, including one of the country's national dailies, a move that at times put Asper himself in the headlines. His editorial policies became the subject of national debate, and some of his newspaper staff quit or were fired. Uh, was it hard? Yes, it's very difficult. They, these, there are some very fine people who just couldn't and still can't uh, a adapt to the way we believe the 21st century requires. Not a choice here. 
Survival is the issue for the publications business. There may have been regrets along the way, but Asper says they stop at fatherhood. If I were asked to describe what I consider my greatest success, it would not be a business test. It would not be a financial test. It would be uh, that I fulfilled uh, uh, my responsibility to my children, of whom I'm quite proud. Well, how are you going to remember Izzy Asper? What do you think of his contributions to Winnipeg and indeed the country? You can send us an email. The address is talkback at cbc.ca or call us tonight. An emotional goodbye for Israel Asper. The oh. National Day of Mourning for Israel Asper. The 71 year old businessman, father, and inspirational sports was laid to rest today. A funeral that was even attended by the Prime Minister. A Channel's Mike Yanni has more. A solemn prayer as the casket of Israel Asper is taken from the Share Zedek Synagogue. Family and friends gathered for an emotional ceremony, remembering his life and contributions. The Jewish community, the city of Winnipeg, and the end entire country have lost a real champion of our worthwhile causes. I wonder if we will see his equal again in our lifetime. More than 1,600 people packed into the synagogue, and those who couldn't get inside gathered outside to hear the touching words of Asper's children. There's really no way to put all of Dad in five minutes. He knew how to create, he knew how to give, he knew how to live, he knew how to nurture, he knew how to love. The reason why his heart stopped was because he put so much of it into the lives of others. And my, and my only wish as I grow up is to be like him. Prime Minister Jean Chrétien, Premier Gary Dewar, and delegates from Israel were among the dignitaries who came to pay their respects to the media mogul, a man many described as one of a kind. This tremendous crowd uh, that is here today uh, is, uh, is really but the tip of the iceberg in terms of the tremendous affection and tremendous respect and regard that people had for his Asper. Like many of the people in attendance, Dana Haida had never met Asper, but she still felt compelled to say goodbye. It just seems like such a commercial world, but he, he had a heart and he had so much, I don't know, to give. And people who do have a lot to give and who do give, I think it's it's such an inspiration. You left us all too early and we made a lot of promises and we're going to keep them. And whenever I look at the stars, I'm going to see you there because I think you did reach them. In Winnipeg, Mike Yanni, A Channel News Now. It was Izzy Asper's final journey through the streets of the city he loved to call home today. The founder of Canada's largest media empire was laid to rest. It was a chance for family, friends, and an entire country to say goodbye. Good evening, Janet Stewart has the night off. He was called Winnipeg's and Manitoba's greatest champion. Today, Izzy Asper was laid to rest. Asper, the founder of Canwest Global Communications, passed away Tuesday. He was 71. Joining us live now is uh, CKY's Rob Wozni. He's the Asper Jewish Community Campus. Rob, what's happening there tonight? Well, Gord, we're here tonight where the organization has placed a book of condolence in the main lobby. And it's been a steady stream of people since it was placed here on Tuesday. And I've talked to people earlier who were here, and I asked them what brought them down to sign the book tonight. Many felt compelled, felt there was something they had to do to pay their respects to Israel and the family. Now, this is just a small outpouring of support, which we saw earlier today, where 1,500 people people came out for the funeral of Izzy Asper. Some came to say goodbye, some came to say thank you. I think he personified Winnipeg. Winnipeg is what it is today because of people like Mr. Asper. It seems all generations knew Israel H. Asper in some way and the contributions he made to Winnipeg. Pretty much just pay her our respects. He did a lot for the city. You don't have to be Jewish or a liberal to appreciate what um, is the Asper has done for uh, Winnipeg. That's why hundreds lined the street outside the Sherry Zedek Synagogue to appreciate what Izzy has done. There's really no way to put all of that in five minutes. But son Leonard and his sister Gail did the best they could. His love of business, his love of jazz, all paled in comparison to his love for his family. I just 
think we can't forget that what dad was all about was heart. He had an incredible capacity to love, and first and foremost was his love for his family. He was nuts about my mom, and I know family meant everything to him. And maybe all that love just wore his heart out. Israel Asper died of a heart attack earlier this week with his family by his side. It's ironic that what failed him is what's often used to describe him. The reason why his heart stopped was because he put so much of it into the lives of others. And my only wish as I grow up is to be like him. Izzy's generosity funded many education, health and religious projects around Winnipeg, including the creation of the Canadian Rights Museum that will be located at the Forks. He confided in his kids he never expected anything in return. And with that, his children plan to continue his generous legacy. We know what's left to be done. We will not let you down. Goodbye, Dad. Goodbye, friend. Now, if you'd like to come down and show your support by signing the Book of Condolence, it will be here until 4 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, and then it will be presented to the Asper family. Gord, back to you. Thanks, CKY's Rob Wozni reporting live tonight. Dignitaries from Winnipeg, Ottawa, and all over the world attended today's funeral. Manitoba Premier Gary Dewar was at the synagogue today. Prime Minister Jean Chrétien also paid his respects. Also there, Canadian Alliance leader Stephen Harper. And so was former Liberal leader and Prime Minister Jean Turner. Prime Minister in waiting, Paul Martin, said Asper's work made Eastern Canada, to, uh, rather made Eastern Canada, warm pan west and, 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 and had the, both television and the newspapers. And he said, I'm going to establish it here in Winnipeg. I think that that was a very, very important sign. And I think it made everybody in the country really stand up and take notice. The city of Winnipeg, various groups and schools like the University of Manitoba and the Asper Business School are planning special services in honor of Izzy Asper. More than likely, they'll be held before the end of the month. Tonight on Global News, they came from Canada and from all around the world. They came to remember a great Canadian. They came to say goodbye to Israel Asper. Good evening. It was a funeral service like no other in the history of this city. Over 1,000 mourners attended, but ultimately it was a funeral just like any other. A heartbroken family bidding a tearful farewell to a loved one. Following an emotional memorial service, Ken West Global founder Israel Asper was buried today. It was a service attended by a crowd of 1,600, a crowd that included the Prime Minister, Federal Cabinet Ministers, the Premier and Lieutenant Governor, not to mention Canadian business tycoons, a number of Asper's friends and benefactors, and of course his family. The service was held this afternoon at the Sherazetic Synagogue, a gathering that evoked all kinds of emotion. Whether they knew him or not, they were all there to pay their last respects to one man who meant something different to everyone. However you remember him, media mogul, businessman, poli poli politician, excuse me, community leader, philanthropist, husband, and father. Global's Connie Tomoto was inside the synagogue today where cameras were not permitted at the request of the Asper family. We're gathered here this afternoon to pay our last respects to Israel Asper. As the service began, the live music of Israel Asper's favorite musician, Gershwin, stopped. Some sat in silence while others wiped tears from their face as the cantor sang the Jewish prayer of the dead. Today's service for Israel Asper wasn't to mourn, but rather to celebrate a man of great significance. We all know the very public uh, Izzy Asper. Um, not so much the private life. Today, the Asper family spoke of a man who accomplished much but never forgot to give. The reason why his heart stopped was because he put so much of it into the lives of others. He knew how to create, he knew how to give, he knew how to live, he knew how to nurture, he knew how to love. Israel Asper was also a man whose actions were never dominated by his success or status. My dad was a regular guy too. He, he, um, he did occasionally walk with princes, but he never lost the common touch. I remember being with him in a McDonald's in Vancouver, because White Spot was closed, wondering how many other billionaires go for cheeseburgers with their son. But what Israel is most remembered for is his philanthropic heart. 
The Aspers spoke of their father's many contributions, but expressed great sadness that his number one passion, the Museum of Human Rights, was left unfinished. He didn't live to see his dream realized of the Canadian Museum for Human Rights and all that it would mean for Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, and the world. But what best described Israel Asper was read in a poem by his three children on behalf of their mother. He was, was our, our north, north, our, our south, south, our east, and, and west, our, our working week, and our Sunday rest, our noon, our midnight, our talk, talk our song. We, we thought, thought that he would last forever. We were wrong. Today's service was attended by some of Canada's political and business elite. With more on that, here's Global's Mike Brown. Prime Minister Kretschmann came and went, not stopping to talk, but the man who would be the country's next leader had kind words for Izzy Asper. I think Izzy would have been very, very proud of his children and his grandchildren. And it's the, the, the love, the great depth of love, and the feeling for their father, I think was just wonderful, wonderful to see. And, and I've got to say that Izzy certainly deserved it. It was the who's who of the federal Liberal Party on hand. Former Deputy Prime Minister Herb Gray called Izzy a Renaissance man and a friend. That we were friends for some 35 years. We first met when he was the crusading tax lawyer against the Benson budget, and I was Benson's parliamentary secretary. We had to cross swords, and after that was over, we became fast friends. So it's a great loss for all of us. One of his uh, most important uh, virtues was, uh, was uh, remaining good friends with people, and his friendships were all friendships that went back many decades. Asper was a man who dedicated himself to the Liberal Party, but wasn't afraid to cross party lines on issues close to him. Many, many gifts and one tiny little flaw, which is being a lifelong Liberal. But uh, besides that, he, uh, he, he actually did cross party lines, and he was never afraid uh, to drop his partisanship and uh, hold hands with, uh, with people from other parties if we shared common cause. When he formed Pan West and, and, and had the both the television and the newspapers and he said I'm going to establish it here in Winnipeg I think that that was a very very important sign and I think it made everybody in the country really stand up and take notice of. members of the Winnipeg business community will miss him and all his energy Izzy was our Izzy it was everybody's Izzy and I I'm, I'm actually quite quite sort of taken aback about how something like this happens and I mean I can't think of anybody uh, that doesn't feel a very profound loss right now and many broadcast industry colleagues and competitors also attended the service. Some notable mentions include, and these are just a few of the names, Ted Rogers and Phil Lynn from Rogers Communications, Jim Shaw of Shaw Communications, John Cassidy, the CEO of Chorus Entertainment, Global Television host Mike Bullard, Jay Switzer of Chum Limited, and Gary Schwartz, now CEO of Onyx Corp, was there along with his wife Heather Reisman, who's the CEO of Chapters Indigo Bookstore chain. Israel Asper built the CanWest global media empire from a single television station here in Winnipeg. And when he passed away suddenly on Tuesday, it was both a national and international news story. And with the long list of luminaries attending today's service, there is little doubt the memorial for the media baron would create a media spectacle. Planes began arriving early this afternoon, two flying in straight from Ottawa, carrying some of Canada's top political figures. The Prime Minister and ranking Manitoba politicians, Sharon Carstairs and Ray Pactican, made the trip, as did more than half a dozen Liberal MPs and Senators. Izzy Asper's sudden passing on Tuesday made newspaper headlines across the country and the final farewell to the media mogul was no different. Friends and family of media mogul Izzy Asper paid their last respects today. Television crews were set up outside the synagogue and dozens of photographers were lined up at a distance with security standing guard, RCMP and city police. We were packed. We were turning people away. After 1,600 mourners made their way in, many others stood outside in the blowing leaves along with the media who were asked to capture what they could from behind a barricade. Despite Izzy's very public life, his family wanted this moment to themselves. This is their time of grief and mourning and they deserve to have that space to be able to do that in a private way. 
Speakers were set up outside for the overflow crowd to hear the touching service. And his life was one long adventure in the pursuit of things that mattered, no matter how hopeless, no matter how far. After the memorial, the very public media mogul made the journey down Portage Avenue for the final time in the company of family and close friends. And it was a very brief stop for most of the dignitaries who flew in for today's service. Many, including the Prime Minister, boarded flights and left the city shortly after the memorial concluded. When Israel Asper started his broadcasting enterprise, he knew nothing about broadcasting and recruited the expertise of Don Brinton, founding a relationship which lasted until today. He was just a, just a genius. Uh, again, uh, you may recall, uh, every time we faced a CRTC hearing, and that was often because we were always applying for something or a, a license or a, a new situation of some kind, he was a very, very good writer to, in terms of presentations to the commission and so on. He was a very good writer. He had been a columnist, of course, and we all knew that he was literary, but he could even on the phone, he could dictate to me and did that many times, he could dictate a presentation in about... 20 minutes over the phone. I'd be scribbl scribbling madly away hoping to get it down because I knew it was going to make a very good presentation if I could remember it and, and keep track of it. He was very good that way and he was, there's no question in my mind that he's going to go down in history as a, a genius. Very creative, very aggressive in both business and broadcasting. Never lost too many battles. Some of them were very, very difficult to win and I was with him in a good number of those. We, Spent a lot of time in court, but uh, it was always positive. And he took on challenges that were tough, but he won most of them. He sure won most of them. I think it's fair to say that Izzy uh, turned uh, the broadcasting establishment on its ear. Glenn O'Farrell of the Canadian Association of Broadcasters knows of Asper's profound effect on Canadian broadcasting. In so many ways, uh, what Izzy's contribution to the system overall was to solidify the system, to make it a stronger broadcasting system here, but also to take Can West and to put it out on an international stage. And he did so with a view to, obviously, the interests of Can West, but he also had a very strong view of how that was good for Canada, for Canada to have strong Canadian companies out on the international stage as well. And my sense is that broadcasters today, you saw the people who attended the service were from every part of the industry, came here to pay tribute to his incredibly unique contribution. Um, and he will be very dearly missed. Tonight with more pictures from the funeral of Izzy Asper from all of us here. Thanks for joining us. We're back here at 1130. Good night. Good, Good night. night. We used to run pass plays in the hallway at home, and Dad often overthrew me, breaking countless hanging lamps with the glorious sound of breaking glass. He and I were never able to convince Mom that it was actually Leonard who broke the lamp. <laughs> I remember being with him in a McDonald's in Vancouver, because White Spot was closed. <laughs> Wondering how many other billionaires go for cheeseburgers with their sons. Now, if you went for a cheeseburger with my dad, you had to come back uh, with the one that had cheese and fried onions only, or else you were, you were nothing. And that you had to convince them to do a special order. But when I said, how many billionaires do this with their son, he just said, Len, some people just don't know how to live. He was nuts about my mom. And I know family meant everything to him. And maybe all that love just wore his heart out. And I don't think that can really be such a bad thing ever. Dad, I know you're watching us from heaven with a nice cold martini sitting in possibly the last remaining smoking section left. <laughs> or maybe you're bombing down an open highway with the roof down and the wind in your head with, of course, your radio tuned to Cool FM. You left us all too early and we made a lot of promises. And we're going to keep them. And whenever I look at the stars, I'm going to see you there because I think you did reach them. Thank you for everything. He found out the hard way to change in the political world can be a slow and painful process. But in philanthropy, he believed it was possible to build a Garden of Eden in the here and now.
Dad, we've heard you, and we heed it well. Save me a seat at the bar. There's really no way to put all of Dad in five minutes. He knew how to create, he knew how to give, he knew how to live, he knew how to nurture, he knew how to love. Thank you for what you gave to the world and to your family. We have your checklist, never any checklist that keep getting ticked off and then The death of Izzy Asper and the government's response to mad cow disease are just some of them. Israel Harold Asper died suddenly in hospital this morning. Early reports say it was a heart attack. This marks the end of a remarkable 71 years. I believe the death of Izzy Asper um, is a really, really big loss for Winnipeg. As a fellow member of the Jewish community, he really, you know, did a lot of things for my people, and he did a lot of things for the city. And we'll never have another philanthropist like him again. And so I just wanted to say that um, everyone should be proud of the way he lived his life. Thank you. I will remember him as a great, very generous, humble man that I think motivated so many Canadians to give back to the Winnipeg community. Well, he, he gave more than just to the Winnipeg community. He gave to Canada and he gave internationally. So uh, I, I would say he's probably one of our greatest Canadian citizens. Jay you know, there's this old saying, if the truth were known about the origins of jazz music, it would never be mentioned in polite society. I'm thinking about that old saying today because I think it has everything to do with Izzy Asper, the entrepreneur, the media mogul, the philanthropist, and the music lover who died on Tuesday, the age of 71. His life was lived like a long jazz solo, which is what he loved. And the one thing Asper never abided by was polite society. Asper was many things in his life. He was a well-known tax lawyer. He was a journalist for the Globe and Mail. He was the leader of Manitoba's Provincial Liberal Party. And in 1973, he captured one of only three seats the party won in that election. He was the CEO, of course, of Canwest Global Communications, and he built the company into Canada's third largest network. Now, in the year 2000, Asper bought Southern newspapers, including, of course, the National Post, making him the biggest media baron in the country. He was also an ardent supporter of two places, of Western Canada and of Israel. But at his heart, Israel Harold Asper was a jazz musician, and he brought the values of jazz, the spontaneity, the rebelliousness, the passion, the grandeur, to every part of his life. And if he became part of polite society, and he did, it was only because they had no choice but to let him in. When I sat down with Israel Asper this summer, I didn't realize it would be the last TV interview he would give. And we talked about many things, from his views on the CBC, to his passion to build a human rights museum in Winnipeg, of course in Winnipeg. But we began the conversation on the topic that has put Israel Asper so often in the spotlight in these past few years, and that is, of course, the Middle East. You've been very critical of the roadmap to peace, you call it, in this speech, roadmap to hell. No, I say it's potentially a roadmap to hell. I, I, I'm very pessimistic about its outcome. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't think it will survive the first phase. I don't mean that I want it not to survive. I'm just saying that it, it's essentially it's a plan that treats the symptoms of the problem but ignores the real problem. And the problem being that uh, this is not about Jerusalem, it's not about refugees, and it's not about borders, and it's not about uh, propping up Abbas. And it's about the fact that the, we're in a hundred year war here. And um, the objective of the entire Arab world, and that includes the Palestinians, uh, is not the, the symptoms I just described, it's the destruction and the eradication of the state of Israel and the killing or expelling of all the Jews. And until that's addressed, you won't have peace. Now, you know that there are peace treaties between Israel and Jordan. Progress to make a blanket statement like the objective of the Arab world is the destruction of Israel does simply it's a blanket statement about there's, almost there's, a billion people. Yeah, there's a hundred years of data 
this is not uh, seen in, in the abstract. Uh, if you read the Egyptian press, listen to the prayers in the Egyptian mosques, listen to the rhetoric of the Egyptian politicians, uh, listen to the uh, education, look at the education that's given to the children in the schools, it is exactly what it was pre, quote, peace. It's a cold peace. And the Arab world has always stated through its leadership that it believes vis-a-vis -vis Israel in gradualism, phasing. So you give, you fight for something, they do, and each time they fight, they get a little more. And, and this is what the current leadership preaches to, even to Hamas. The terrorist organization. But I mean, you are, you can say, and the criticism is that you're simply selectively choosing. That in fact, there are real facts on the ground that would suggest that there's been a very different picture emerging from this monolithic, the Arab world, that's simply gradually trying to phase out Israel. Oh, if you get below, if you get down below the uh, political leadership, you're absolutely right. The um, the Israelis and the Palestinians, in the great majority, can and should live together in comfort and harmony and peace. But the Arab nationalists, the Islamic extremists, the religious, the cultural leaders keep whipping up and teaching incentive to incitement, to hatred, to homicide bombing by, um, by celebrating the martyrs, the people who were uh, the murderers, the terrorists. And that, that creates a frenzy and a hysteria in the population. There's no doubt about what the leaders say, whether it's Nasser or whether it's Nasrallah in, uh, in Hezbollah in, uh, in uh, Lebanon or whether it's uh, uh, Yasser Arafat in Ramallah. There, there's no, no question about what the objective is. I want to talk to you about what, you know, we were going to skip over to that, that point where you said there has to be a victor and a vanquished for something to change in the Middle East. That's correct. The point I was making was that in, in most modern warfare, there has never been peace unless someone has won a war and somebody's lost it. A victor and a vanquished, as you're quoting. At that point, the victor is able to say, okay, you've surrendered. Now let's live this way henceforth. That was how, how World War II ended. That's how World War I uh, tried to end. Every time we get close in the Middle East to there being a victor and a vanquished, uh, the world stops the, blows the whistle, time out, and says, let's try to resolve this. So what would a victor and vanquished look like? Well, it would, it would. It, it, I mean, that's, it, it, for a lot of people, that's terrifying terminology. Not peace, but vanquished. Well, vanquished means defeated. And so, but, but, but the Palestinians, are essentially defeated anyway, militarily. Well, not if they, not if they continue to drive into pizzerias and buy, blow up babies and elderly people and women, as opposed to fighting like soldiers in the field. So what would you envision? The Palestinians have killed a thousand civilians in the last two and a half years. Since the peace, this, this current ceasefire, <laughs> which is a joke, 85 rocket attacks have taken place against Israel, and there's a ceasefire. But people, people quote are, the other side, too. People, quote, your, people quote Israeli violence on Palestinians. Not true. Come on, not since the, peace, uh, the ceasefire. Not since the ceasefire. And yes, uh, uh, look, there have been I mean, uh, Palestinians killed in combat, but militants, combatants. And civilians. And, and inadvertently. But there's a difference between inadvertently in a self-defense action, civilians being killed, as opposed to civilians being targeted. Part of the Arab mentality and propaganda uh, uh, mechanism throughout the Middle East is to lie. From your speech, you wrote, approximately 500,000 Arabs, mainly at the exhortation of their own leaders, and despite guarantees and appeals made by Israel, fled their homes to other Arab enclaves. Right. Now, there's been much dispute about, and these people are now known as the Palestinian refugees. Yes. There's been much dispute about this notion that they fled and that the Jews as kind of... As opposed to being expelled. Yes. Not true. In the media 
at the time. So it's indisputable. The Declaration of Independence calls on the Arabs to stay. Don't flee. You have nothing to fear. You will be given every single right that, that the Jewish population gets. Freedom, democracy, equality. But, and I'll show it to you in black and white, because it was by pamphlets and radio broadcasts. I'll show you uh, ads taken in the, uh, by the, la the history group, the Labor uh, 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 Congress of Israel, urging the Arabs not to flee. Full-page ads. So th there's no doubt about this. Talk to me about the 850,000 Jews who were driven out, beaten, publicly hanged, flogged, stabbed, raped, all property expropriated in Morocco, in Syria, in Iraq. And your point here is that, well, the world is talking about Palestinian refugees, you're suggesting that Absolutely. no one's talking about Jewish refugees. Equity requires that the two issues be resolved mutually and fairly, concurrently. But Let's not just talk about one set. There's, there's a double standard here. The Arab propaganda has been much more effective than the Jewish propaganda, or it's really because everybody talks about the Palestinian refugees that the UN spends $400 million a year looking after. The, Air, the Jewish refugees were absorbed by Israel, two-thirds were. Nobody compensated them. And so justice demands that if you're going to deal with the Palestinian refugees, and indeed we must, uh, they are the, the, the sins of the fathers should not be uh, visited on the children and grandchildren. But you have to deal with it, and equity has to be done. But it would be an inequity if you didn't concurrently do the right thing by the Jewish refugees. So I mean, would you suggest that there is, therefore, no such thing as a legitimate Palestinian nation? Of course I am. It, uh, it's not take, a legitimate people? Don't, don't take my word for it. I will quote you the Syrians, the Jordanians, King Abdullah himself of Jordan, who was very well respected and very well loved and got along very well with, you know, the Western world. He was the one who said, there is no Palestinian nation, there is no Palestinian language, there is no Palestinian culture. But would you not even suggest that it's, that a Palestinian nation or a people ought to get a nation? They've got one. It's called Jordan. And therefore, how do you win this? Though? I think if you go back to uh, the original concept of Palestine, uh, before the generational hatred was generated by its leadership, its, its clergy, its educators, its uh, politicians. The Palestinian culture mindset has got to be Islamic. It's got to be modernized. It's got to be brought into the 21st century. He was always an eloquent man to talk with, but when we come back, Izzy Asper talked about bias in the media and why he thought we, here at the CBC, were one of the worst offenders. Stick around for that. In my opinion, and the opinion of a lot of objective, independent observers who are not partisans in this debate, CBC has a bias against Israel. Welcome back to a special edition of CBC News Sunday. You know, in the last couple of years, Izzy Asper and the CBC had, well, shall we say, a few differences of opinion. Just this last week, CBC's former Middle East correspondent, Neil McDonald, demanded an apology from Izzy Asper for what McDonald claims were unfair attacks and unsubstantiated criticism. How the media reports on the situation in the Middle East has become something of a national debate. And so I asked Izzy Asper for his views on the subject. Uh, let me ask you to explain the bias that you say the CBC has and other media outlets. What is at the root of it? Are you suggesting that there's anti-Semitism at the root of that bias? I'm quoting uh, Martin Luther King, Jr., who said, if you are an anti-Zionist, my friend, you are an anti-Semite. Veiled anti-Semitism has crept into the dialogue in the guise of anti-Israel criticism. One of the things that annoys people about Asper is when they hear this discussion about Israel and they say, look, 
he hasn't said that Israel has done one thing wrong. He oh. only argues one th oh, one side. No, no, he hasn't talked about the Israel. settlement. He hasn't talked about any, uh, you know. I don't say that everything Israel does is beyond criticism. I am a very harsh critic of Israel. You are a harsh critic I of Israel. Better, yes, I, I'm a I supporter of Israel. I, you said you're a supporter, but I've never seen uh, heard that you're a harsh critic. Give me an example of harsh criticism. I think the entry into the Oslo Agreement was a, 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 a terrible thing that Israel did. I think the offer that Barack made at Camp David uh, to uh, break through the logjam of Oslo was a terrible... You call it egregious in the... In the sense that it was remarkable. The, l l let me... But your criticism, you know, it, is simply because is the Israeli government is not agreeing with what you think they should do, but have yeah. you been a harsh critic about Israel's actions towards the Palestinians? Well, um, I'm, I'm sure uh, that there have been instances, if you want, you know, if you describe one for me, uh, where I would say Israel was wrong. I have no, uh, no, I'm not suggesting that what everything Israel does is perfect or is, is right. So I, I could describe, you know, graphically and sickeningly and dramatically how uh, an Arab atrocity took place against an Israeli. And I'm sure there are instances on the other side, too. But I, I'm not doing that. That's hysterical, and, and that's inflammatory. Too. But it's news, and you've been very critical of the news. You see, yeah. isn't news's job to describe those exact pictures oh, on no. both sides? No, no, no. I, I, don't, I don't say news shouldn't. We're, talk, not, we're talking about me, what I'm talking about. I'm dealing strictly with the big picture. Should the media deal with the horror and brutality and humanity of war? Yes, but both sides, and fairly. For example, you know yourself that you'll see media, the, the media generally, there is this, uh, in some instances, there's a media bias a against Israel. In don't don't just say in some, news. you've said the CBC, ABC, the New York Times. Well, I've proved it too. Is the CBC anti-Semitic? One could conclude that, one could argue otherwise. But do you conclude that? I think there's a strain of anti-Semitism in the CBC, yeah. But let's just take the CBC, and we, we said we're not going to get into this. We said we probably would. Look, uh, CBC, Neil MacDonald, your infamous uh, uh, anti-Israel correspondent for years in the Middle East. Or better known as our correspondent in the Middle East. No, I'm just saying, he, he is, I've heard him, I've seen him on panels, I've seen him on, like in briefing sessions in videotape. He is very, very um, anti-Israel. But you've got to prove it. You have to give example. All right. His refusal to call a terrorist a terrorist. Neil MacDonald called them militants. He called them activists. Even Abbas, the prime, prime minister of uh, uh, the Palestinian Authority, calls them terrorists, but not Neil MacDonald. Before you say that that is in some way a sign that Neil MacDonald is, as you called him, infamous and anti-Semitic, in the CBC for 25 years, the w this idea of using the word terrorist has been very suspect. It's not a policy. You're allowed to use the word, but, and, and what I saw, this is the ombudsman's com uh, comments on the word terrorist for the CBC, which, by the way, I'm happy to give you, but it says that simply it's a loaded word, and the CBC will quote someone using it, but they prefer not to use those words because it's so loaded, because people call Israel terrorists, Israelis call someone the Palestinians terrorist, and it's a word that everyone well, bandies around. So, but it's not a bias on Neil McDonald's part, and the CBC has, a, has papers on this. But you must remember that the CBC was accused of bias uh, in the form of Mr. Tony Berman, your news director, uh, by Norman Spector, former ambassador to Israel, uh, and, uh, and we, Global Television, offered, invited both Mr. Sector and Mr. Berman to debate the issue on television. Mr. Berman refused. Actually, it was our show that also invited both. You did, too. Uh, indeed, we uh, did. But according to Mr. Spector, you loaded the dice. Apparently, you were uh, uh, going to bring on some other commentators or something. It actually wasn't. It was simply uh, Mr. Spector wanted Neil McDonald to come on, and, and Berman offered to do a straight one-on-one. -on -one. But it was, it was actually a logistical thing that has been blown out of proportion. It's interesting. Give me another example. I mean, you're talking about the word the word terrorist and the refusal to use it, although it, it hasn't shown a, a bias on any side of the CBC. They haven't used that word in any other circumstance. Are there any other examples oh, that sure. would show? It, it, if you go back and watch the CBC reporting, CBC contributed to the mass media myth of a massacre in Janine. 
I, I, as I say, I didn't bring the case with me today or prepared to make the case. I'm just telling you that let suffice it to say that in my opinion and the opinion of a lot of objective independent observers who are not partisans in this debate, CBC has a bias against Israel. Can I ask you a question? CBC has a number of reporters in Israel and some, and certainly global, which you have a stake in, I mean, they don't have anybody posted in the Middle East. That's not true. We receive, we have correspondence in Israel as we speak. A regular, and always have. You have a bureau? What is a bureau? A bureau is a place you rent and people park. We have at least, between Global and Southern, at least two or three people. Martin Himmel, for example, broadcasts uh, routinely um, from Jerusalem. But not, a, but there's not a regular, someone regularly covering that beat. They, they come there's and go in that area, right? Well, we, whenever we want to run a Canadian report, as opposed to a purchased, you know, report from Reuters or CNN or wherever, Martin Himmel, what, what, this is a red herring. What, what do you care how we get our Israeli news? When we come back, Izzy Asper gives us his view of the CBC. Would he fund it? Yes. But with a few big catches, come back to find out. I don't believe in state-owned public broadcasting. I don't believe in uh, state-subsidized uh, public broadcasting. And I don't believe in state-subsidized uh, corporations, you, CBC, competing against the private tax-paying uh, sector of the economy. Few people had as strong views on the role of the public broadcaster as Izzy Asper. Should the CBC be cut? Should it be continued? Should it be reshaped? Should it be scrapped altogether? These are Izzy Asper's views. Now, for a guy who's been as controversial uh, as you have over the years... Me? And you, no, you. Me? You, no, you're not... Why do you think I'm controversial? How dare I say that? Do you want... I wasn't prepared to debate this, but would you like me to have the example? <laughs> but I, you, but I, sir, I really got to absorb that one. Yeah. Well, you, you know, think you, about you, it. You, when you, when you, hey, you, hey, you're talking to the CBC. If I live in Winnipeg. You're, you're the poster of the controversy at the CBC. Oh well, they, yeah. They, yeah. That, the, they, there you go. They're, they, I'm told that. You're told. But that shows I mean, their pettiness and vendetta. You know. A minor guy like you owns some few newspapers and a few TV stations and wants to shut us down. No, no, I, I don't, don't want to. Wait a minute. Now you open the door again. Look, I better make my position on CBC okay, clear. Yeah. I think there should be a CBC. I believe in public broadcasting. There's a lot I like. Stop to the tape. I think we got it. No, Keep going. No, no, no. All that. You mean this is on tape? We're not live? <laughs> Look. Um, and I'm, uh, 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 I'm ignoring my complaint about dishonest reporting or bias. But I believe in public broadcasting. I don't believe in state-owned public broadcasting. I don't believe in uh, state-subsidized uh, public broadcasting. And I don't believe in state-subsidized corporations, you, CBC, competing against the private tax-paying uh, sector of the economy. Same with the BBC, you'd say the same in England? Of course. Now, I do believe in public, for example, I, I happen to be a huge fan of CBC radio. Um, you know, you, you, you can't propagandize uh, the music they play. Uh, so, um, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, you know, I, I, I say I listen to CBC radio because it's, I don't watch much television because I'm moving a lot around. around. Uh, but, you know, in the United States, you've got National Public Radio, which is, is by the way, a terrible, dishonest reporter. Uh, and one of the, but at least because it's funded by donors uh, and sponsors, they can bring the like it's accountable. When you're only you don't think the CBC is accountable? Absolutely unaccountable. We're accountable yeah. to the public. We have a mandate. You, you everybody's well, entitled to have a say. Accountability isn't. Accountability isn't allowing me to criticize you. 
Accountability is allowing me to cut off your funding if you're doing something that I don't like. They do it all the time. Who does? The government cuts CBC funding all the time. Not, not because that, uh, they do that for budgetary concerns. Well, but you they remember, the mandate was as an arm's length. You, you want the CBC to only be accountable to the government funding, no. otherwise we wouldn't be allowed to criticize the government. No, I... Uh, There's good no, reason no, why we're no. not accountable That's for that. That's why I don't want the government funding the national public broadcaster. We, the public, who want it, we should be funding it. That's would you, Izzy Asper, fund a public broadcaster that your company and you would have to pay for? In the circumstances I described, of course I would. Where it's not competing with the private sector in terms of uh, advertising, uh, commercial programming. You know, we are, we, we the private sector, we, we are taxpayers. We have to make money to, so that we can sell our shares to the public and be able to fund our development and growth. We're private sector. We should not have to compete against the state sub subsidized or state supported CBC. What about the idea of essential service that but, that key, that the CBC is providing something that the market simply won't provide on the mass of that the market will get things like not to demonize it but Canadian Idol or a lot of the American shows and what CBC does is provide a lot of Canadian content to develop our culture and to determine what kind of society we live in. As our culture, comma, as defined by you guys in CBC. As defined by the public. Look, look at why is CBC, why is CBC's ratings so down for that very kind of programming you're describing, say over the last 5, 10, 15, 20. We've part of the reason is fragmentation, but part of the reason is that the public doesn't want that. Now, I don't, I'm not that, happy about that. It could be that the, that the CBC is competing with imported American programming uh, on a mass culture, and quality isn't simply determined well, by well, mass numbers. Well, d d sh shouldn't, shouldn't the market decide whether CBC lives or dies? Uh, and if you say no, uh, public broadcasting has a value, as I agree. You're a jazz connoisseur. Does the public decide what the greatest... Ja record is you know jazz doesn't sell well, very many records you, connoisseurship excuse works. me you know your your typical cbc you give me a bunch of myths do you know that last year um the only category of cd sales that went up in canada was jazz really it's a fact jazz is doing fine on the selling cds but are we going to talk about that? I'd love to. I know you want to talk about jazz. It's still I, I got a jazz radio station now. I'm, I'm fulfilling my destiny. The, um, you were saying that shouldn't think, compete against the product. Yeah, you shouldn't compete by selling commercials. And you shouldn't compete in, uh, I'm saying the public broadcaster, in mass appeal programming. You should, you should be, the CBC that I would like to see would be supported by me individual. Oh, yeah, there'd be some grants for programming. Like, you know, like I get, I think, uh, or my, uh, the Canadian production industry gets grants for programming. We don't as broadcasters. Um, but, um, uh, just, and so does PBS in the United States get grants. And I'm not necessarily suggesting the PBS model. Uh, but uh, CBC should be paid for by we who want it. And the taxpayer who doesn't want it or watch it, uh, w w when CBC started, it was legitimate. The only way you could uh, fund it was by a universality of, you know, absorption of cost. But that was, uh, what, 70 years ago? Yeah, 70 years ago. So all the Canadian content that CBC produces, you don't think it has a, a value? No, wait a minute. I didn't say it didn't have a value. I said it should not be owned by the Owned by the state. Well, where, but who would make it then? Well, who, who do you think runs, who, who finances PBS? Not the government. We, the public finance it, because we, the public, like it. Different economic base, though. Oh, yes, I agree, and that's why what the, you can't use the, the can't use, yeah, you can't use the PBS base. Well, okay. no, uh, uh, but anyway, yes, you cannot use this, uh, the, the PBS base, but you can use an adaptation. There are a lot of ad adaptations. Sponsorship, you, in other words, I'm not saying totally commercial free. I'm saying 100% Canadian, uh, you should not be competing with CTV for baseball rights and football rights and hockey night in Canada. There's a lot of the private sector that can take that and should take it. So my view of the public broadcaster is that they should do the programming that nobody else can afford to do. 
That this is, that's, uh, that's the, and the, where will the problem is no, no, no one can afford it. You always say, give them the stuff no one wants to buy. As soon as the CBC well, makes wait, something wait, profitable, wait. you say the private sector would like it. No, 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 no. Yeah, you should not be competing with the private sector is what I said. The CBC should produce programming that, that is of high quality that no, the private sector can't afford to do. Afford it because you're not getting big audiences on it. And then, then, it's, it's, then you're it's, creating it's, a losing it's, formula it's, for the, it's a, well, public broadcaster. TV, the public broadcaster in the U.S. doesn't make any money. Its costs are covered by the people who appreciate what they're doing. Membership. Sp sponsorship. Oh, sponsorship. And membership. I, so would, would Izzy Asper, the Asper Foundation, a charitable organization, contribute, make a donation to that CBC? Absolutely. I do that kind of thing all day long. When we return to this special edition of CBC News Sunday, Izzy Asper shares his vision of what would have been his last big project, and he had many of them. This one was a human rights museum. Stick around. Here we're aiming for the stars. It's not worth doing if we don't aim for the stars. I mean, I have other things to do with my life, and I only want to do it if this becomes an international architectural icon symbol of Canada. We all know that Izzy Asper was a chain smoker. He lived life to the fullest and not necessarily in the healthiest way. He had a bypass surgery now 20 years ago. But he was a man of great projects and great visions, visions that would unfold over time, and he fully expected to see them come true. Despite all the controversy surrounding his views on the Middle East, his last great project was the foundation of the world's first human rights museum, located, of course, in his beloved Winnipeg. This was going to be his legacy. Here's how he describes it. Let's talk about the Human Rights Museum. Uh, where did this initiative start? What's your, what's your idea behind this? Well, I've been interested in human rights all my life as, as a lawyer, uh, very active in civil rights stuff. And, uh, and in fact, the first thing I did when I went into the legislature back around 1970... In Manitoba. Yeah, I introduced the first uh, Manitoba Bill of Rights. I, I, I regard the Canadian Charter of Rights as one of the great milestones in the history of this country. So I've always been interested in it, and uh, when Diefenbaker, uh, in fact, uh, I, I was involved uh, as a lawyer in the uh, push to get John Diefenbaker's, I think it was 1956 or something, the Canadian Bill of Rights, there is that. I've, I've been close to, and very thrilled with the process in 82, uh, when uh, Trudeau and Chrétien pulled the miracle. When they talk about Jean Chrétien's the Charter of Rights, le yeah. legacy or Pierre Trudeau's legacy, I'm telling you, future generations are going to stand up and cheer because the, the, Bill of, the Charter of Rights, there are people who don't like Charters of Rights. I won't discuss that for the moment. There are people like me who say this is not a perfect Charter of Rights. But by God, thank heavens we've got it. Uh, and so, uh, otherwise, ask any female who's been empowered with equality by the Charter of Rights. Ask any gay or lesbian who, who's been suddenly able to have equality because of the Charter, and on and on. So I went to Pierre Trudeau in 82 and said, look, uh, I, I, I was a, a previous political colleague of his. You can say the word liberal without stuttering. Oh, well, that's two syllables. <laughs> uh, no, uh, 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 I was an ag agrarian prairie liberal. Pierre was a Montreal, and I guess you call it Central Canada down here. Right. Anyway, so we, I, I, I put the proposition to him that this was such a monumental achievement that it ought to be celebrated in some tangible way that, that the, just like the American Declaration of Independence is, and on and on. And he agreed with me, but his agenda was full. And um, he um, uh, just couldn't get at it. Loved the idea, but couldn't get at it. Um, and so I parked it for a while because I got busy. And uh, about three years ago, I, uh, there had been an attempt to get a, a Holocaust and Human Rights Museum. And there had been a parliamentary committee and it had bogged down in competition between the various 
interest groups and ethnic groups and racial groups and, and it exploded. And I came to the conclusion that the only way it could get done was if the private sector led it. So I got a feasibility study and uh, it looked like it would work. And the unique thing was because I am a Canadian who believes in the decentralization of the badges of Canada, our institutions right across the country, the logical place to put the, the museum was Winnipeg. Everything does not have to be in Ottawa. In a well, uh, in a well developed democracy, the principal institutions and, and the vision the, uh, of, of the nation got to be spread across the country, can't be centralized, so that people feel in Calgary or in Vancouver that the government in Ottawa is their government, not the government down there, because they can drive to work and they can see, you know, uh, some badge of uh, the country. So, uh, next step was to um, uh, apply for uh, some uh, Western diversified, Western diversified funding and I put in money and we, they did, and we did a very, very comprehensive feasibility study. We were able to engage the finest, uh, most fabulous team of experts, and it turned out every one of them was Canadian. What a joy to learn that, that some of the best museum developers in the world are Canadians. So we were able to keep it at home, and finally we developed that much material on it. Why the focus on human rights? Well, in the first place, there is no human rights museum, get this, anywhere in the world. The most important aspect of life, your right to life, liberty, freedom of choice, da 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 da. The whole nine yards of living is, is tied up in your human rights. And there is no place in the world where that, that idea is taught. And if you want to humanize this planet, you have to start with what are the, what is the social contract? What are the rights? with which I'm born. We have to celebrate human rights. Now, that could be located in Geneva, or could be located in anywhere. But we want to celebrate and teach the human rights story of Canada, warts and all, because our children aren't taught human rights in school. I've got children who have got probably three degrees, who've never been required to study human rights, the cornerstone of our society, suddenly we get a charter of rights. It's time to celebrate what we've got. And it's also time to make sure we're teaching our, our kids. It wasn't always like that. Women did not have the vote. They were not legal persons. Aboriginals were sent to separate uh, schools. Uh, 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 Ukrainians in World War I were interned, citizens, Japanese were interned in World War II. We have to tell those stories. Refugee ships, both Jews and Sikhs, were turned away for people to die from this country. So we have some wars. The Acadians were expelled from their home in New Brunswick by the British, the Canadians, dispersed around the world. So we have some stories to tell. We have stories to tell about the Mennonite uh, community. We have stories to tell about the Duke of Borgia. Does everyone get the same space there? I mean, we have... No, you... you, you there no. is that, that criticism that there's one genus, the Holocaust, has taken greater space in the human rights. Oh, sure, rights. That's, that, that's true. No, it no, is no. true? Let me, oh, yeah, let me explain. No, why, it, well, no, no, there are... It is a major feature. The, the museum hasn't been laid out yet. But it will be, there's no question. There will be a uh, prominence because we're going to tell the story of the causes. What happens when we aren't vigilant in the protection of human rights? There is no better way to teach the causes, rather the results of, of what happens. Here was a country, Germany, one of the most cultured countries, just like Canada, produced the finest scientists, the finest musicians, the finest composers, the finest poets, finest judges, civilized, and it elects democratically a government that democratic, Hitler was no dictator from the beginning, and descended, descended, descended because people didn't watch it, people didn't care. And what it teaches you, the, the viewer, 
Because the Holocaust wasn't just about Jews. Gypsies were slaughtered, homosexuals were slaughtered, the elderly were slaughtered, people with physical impairment were slaughtered. The, this barbaric conduct in the 20th century of uh, an enlightened country? And it happened. So of course you tell it. When does it open? When does it open? <laughs> I'm still raising the money. Well, you know, you're a guy, you're an active guy. Uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm dedicated, I'm yeah, committed, I'm, I uh, may, may be pathological, but I, 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 uh, uh, I, I believe... You're announcing it now, but you will open it... Oh, if, if the stars align, I'd like to believe that on Canada Day 07, the latest 08, the Queen will come, Mandela will come, the descendants of Gandhi will come, the descendants of Martin Luther King Jr. will come and we'll, we'll, we'll open it. Do you have an architect yet? No. What we're doing as we speak is preparing, and this is key to this program. We Canadians have a tendency to reach, aim for the middle, not the top, not for the stars. Here we're aiming for the stars. It's not worth doing if we don't aim for the stars. But, I mean, I, I have other things to do with my life, and I only want to do it if this becomes an international architectural icon symbol of Canada. The idea is that when you see the Sydney Harbour, you see the Opera House, and you know without anything on the screen that you know you're in Sydney. You see the Eiffel Tower, you know you're in Paris, you're in France. When you see Big Ben, you know you're in... We don't have such an edifice in this country. So this will be, you know, paramount. And therefore, we'll have an international um, um, exhibition, uh, rather, uh, contest, uh, which we're, we're, we're getting ready right now. Hey. But I haven't got all the money for it. Okay, yet. but you forgot the CN Tower, for God's sake. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. If that symbol... Well, uh, 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 I would like to hope that we would have a symbol that isn't... I don't want to use any... Uh, Go ahead. <laughs> Go ahead. I am the Winnipegger. Take your shot at Toronto. Go ahead. <laughs> Oh, no, I love being in this uh, disease-free city, uh, 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 coming from mad cow country and uh, West Nile viruses. And great uh, privilege to be here. It's a great land. <laughs> it's a great pleasure to speak with you. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. I'll just say one final comment about Mr. Asper before we close. After I finished that interview, I was accosted by, by colleagues all over the CBC building to find out exactly what he said and exactly what he was like. He was that kind of man. You wanted to hear what he had to say. To some people, Izzy Asper was an adversary, but he was the best kind of adversary to have. The adversary that makes you better at what you do, makes you challenge your own assumptions. They don't make people like that anymore for his fearlessness, for his boldness and his Vision. He will be missed all across this country. That's it for this special episode of CBC News Sunday. I'm Evan Solomon. I'll see you again on Sunday. He relied on Izzy Asper for his generosity. Now his children are going to take over his causes, an interview with a close family friend about their plans. Welcome back. There are numerous institutions that relied on gifts from Izzy Asper, both here in Winnipeg and in Israel. His death prompts the question, what will become of those causes? Earlier today, we spoke with a close family friend about that question, Mr. Neil Duboff. Here now is that interview. Mr. Duboff, to what extent will there be a philanthropic void now that Mr. Asper has passed away? I'm confident that the family, his children, his, 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 his widow, uh, will clearly stand by his philanthropic pursuits, that they understand the importance of charity as, as Izzy understood it, and that their hearts and their minds are in the same places that Izzy was to make sure that, that, that his philanthropic pursuits will be continued. And when you say stand by, how exactly will they do that, do you think? I would think that certainly if, to the extent that he started a project, they'll, they'll make sure that, that it gets finished and they'll, 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 they'll follow it through to the end of whatever the pursuit is. And, and in particular in terms of the new museum that I know that the family is very committed to and I know that Gail is very committed to and, and they will make sure that it gets finished as uh, Izzy had the vision for. Mm -hmm. And indeed, Mr. Asper had projects both here and abroad in Israel uh, to promote education of, of the nation of Israel. 
um, what is the state of those projects abroad? Um, I would. I'm not familiar with all the details, and certainly there's other people in the family who would be, but my understanding is that they will all continue the same as they would have while he was alive, and that the commitment to the family, to the State of Israel, and to the philanthropic pursuits in the State of Israel will continue, whether it's at the Hebrew University or whether it's in villages where he's trying to connect the villages to the Internet to make sure that people all over the world have access to communication. And as you pointed out, those that will see these projects uh, continue on are his immediate family, his children. That's right. Um, you know them very well. Most of us don't. How well equipped are they um, to assume these, these responsibilities? I, I think that, that in my view, the legacy that, that, that Izzy Asper left was his children and his, his deep um, seeding within his children of the sense of commitment towards the community, the Canadian community, the Manitoba community, the community in Israel, and the community to pursue human rights and other causes of justice. And I believe his, his, his children have that deeply embedded within them. What about their commitment to Winnipeg? Mr. Asper was certainly well known for that. How committed are his, his children to Winnipeg? I was leaving the Asper home last night, and Leonard made it very clear to me that Winnipeg's a great city, and he loves to call it his home. Do you have an anecdote? that you can share with us? What is perhaps uh, your most vivid memory of, of Mr. Asper? What I would like to remind Manitobans and Winnipeggers and Canadians is how important that he was to, to our community, how he helped shape our community where it was, both philanthropically, charity-wise, uh, business-wise, and that it, as opposed to other people who might take the monies that they've been able to, to accumulate and use them for personal purposes, he really did it to try and improve the world and try and make the world a better place. And I think that it, as, a, as a general statement, that we have a lot to be thankful for, for having him here, and for making sure that, that he taught his children that they'll continue the same thing. Now, you've said that if there is a void to be filled, it's that we won't ever know what Mr. Asper was contemplating in his right. final months, weeks. Right. Tell me what you mean by that. I, I, I think that uh, uh, Mr. Asper had was always thinking. I think he had lots of ideas about how to make the world a better place, how to make the community a better place, how to pursue rights. And while I believe that all of his children and his grandchildren will have similar vision, uh, Izzy was, a, was, was amazing. He was, he was a genius, and, and he certainly uh, was in a position to be able to pursue his dreams and, and his, his, his great pursuits. Thank you so much for your time, Mr. Dubon. You're welcome, ma'am. Students at the University of Manitoba's Business School put their studies on hold this morning to remember former graduate Israel Asper. Students from the Asper School of Business and many others packed the Drake Center this morning for a memorial tribute to Israel Asper. The Can West Global founder and Winnipeg philanthropist passed away suddenly last Tuesday at the age of 71. He graduated back in 1957 from the university where he learned much more than just the law. And at university, he acquired the tools that, with his will and imagination, made him what he was. Certainly a tough businessman, but also a good man, a principled man, a man for others, as his tradition expected him to be. David Asper says his father truly loved the University of Manitoba, where his entrepreneurial spirit flourished. Nothing was impossible to him. Nothing. There were only problems and solutions. The problem we have today is that we don't have Izzy anymore. The solution is for all of us to pick up where he left off, because the bright future he envisioned is totally within our grasp. Asper was buried last Thursday following a memorial service attended by more than 1,500 people, a crowd that included the Prime Minister, Cabinet Ministers, and a slew of Canadian business leaders and broadcasting colleagues with us. Time staff and students at the University of Manitoba are paying tribute to late alumnus Israel Asper. The University of Manitoba held a ceremony today at the Drake Center, home of the IH Asper School of Business. The center was established in 1997 with the help of a $10 million donation from Izzy Asper. The school features a memorial highlighting the late media mogul's accomplishments and his dedication to the university. He put his money where his mouth was. 
He believed in supporting higher education and providing access. He wanted to challenge people to contribute to the university so that it could be truly the benefit of all. And that's why we wanted to honor him. In total, Asper donated more than $13 million to programs and facilities at the U of M. Please welcome the new chairman of the Academy of Canadian Cinema and Television, Paul Breton. Good evening, as chair of the Academy of Canadian Cinema and Television, I welcome you to the 18th Gemini Awards Gala, our annual celebration of excellence in Canadian television. For more than 50 years, our domestic television industry has been defined by the power of its ideas. One of those truly entrepreneurial, ambitious ideas was Israel Asper, founder of the media empire that would become known as CanWest Global. When he passed away 10 days ago, Canada bid farewell to a leading force in Canadian broadcasting. As he started with a single television station, and in just 25 years grew that into a multimedia empire that includes broadcasting, internet, and print properties around the world. On behalf of the members, the board, and the staff of the Academy, we salute Izzy Asper for his legacy of dedication, not just in broadcasting, but also to his family, his community, and his country. All of us will miss his